um, or share them with somebody else. So welcome everyone. I'm really glad you could join us. So uh, we're part of a group called Reproducibility for Everyone. Um, we're a group of volunteers. Uh, the majority of us are researchers. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to bring introductory tools and methods that can improve the rigor and reproducibility of your work um, to folks in an accessible, practical way. Uh, so there's lots of resources. If you're interested in reproducibility and want to learn more, I recommend you reach out because we have a, a group of, of people who would love to help answer your questions and, and, um, and talk more about reproducibility. Uh, so we have a couple materials here you can use for reference. We have the link here to our slide deck, so you can um, reuse that. It's openly licensed. Um, we have a shared notes doc, and I'll show you what that is. Um, the shared notes doc, can we see this, is a little collaborative note uh, taking document. Um, if you want to ask questions during the workshop, I recommend you can put them in there. And then not only can uh, Batul and I um, respond to them, but also the other participants of the workshop can also respond to them um, because we do oftentimes have uh, a lot of knowledge in the room. And then finally, we have a handout and this is put together by our volunteers their favorite reproducibility resources. So um, that is available also for your, your reference. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, and if you have questions about any of those resources, I recommend you reach out to me or any of the other uh, reproducibility for everyone folks. You can see down here, we're on Twitter, we have an email address and we have a website. So my name's April and I'll get started uh, my Twitter handle's here. If you ever have questions after the workshop, just yell at me. <laughs> so we have to thank our sponsor as always, Chan Zuckerberg um, Initiative and AdGene, um, as well as uh, Benjamin uh, Swessinger, who was one of the original um, creators of these workshops. And we just recently uh, created a preprint to talk more about what we're doing, if you're interested in the history of, of why we're doing this and um, what the resources are available for you to reuse. So yes, the Etherpad is a place to ask questions, but feel free to also put them in the chat since we are a small group. Um, we should be able to handle uh, questions in the chat as well. So that'll be your choice, which, which place you ask questions in, but please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. So let's get to the first module of our workshop is um, on data visualization and analysis, is specifically in the ways that those uh, relate to transparency and reproducibility in research. So one of the fundamental things to keep in mind when you're trying to show your data in a publication, for example, or any time that you're trying to communicate your study to someone else, um, you want to be as transparent as possible in how you show your data. So uh, this little graphic here is a fun way of illustrating how the choice of visualization that you make for your uh, data um, could actually be hiding some of the story. So we have this little bar chart here and all those little tiny um, fun bits of data are hiding behind the bar chart. Uh, whereas on the right, we can actually see a little bit more how these little um, bits of data relate to one another. Um, and the key and the theme that you're going to hear through this section is about picking your visualization to be as transparent as possible and to allow the reader themselves to engage with the data as much as possible. So summary statistics alone are not enough to actually um, allow people to understand and engage with your research. We often share summary statistics as like a core part of how we communicate our research. And that's fine. It's good to include the types of expected summary statistics in your papers and other uh, ways that you share your research. But um, on their own, 
um, it doesn't actually allow people to understand the actual data underlying uh, your research. And that's because summary statistics are just showing part of the uh, story. So you can see here, these are all the same summary statistics um, for all these different uh, distributions of data. So try and think a little bit beyond the summary statistics and we'll talk a little bit about how to do that uh, well. So um, when you are sharing your uh, plots, for example, um, when you're choosing a plot, you should think about what plot actually allows the reader to dive in, explore, and become an active participant in the data. Um, and as you can see on the left here, we have a bar chart, and um, you're actually uh, providing much less information for the reader, and um, the reader is just going to accept your interpretation of, of that data because the data is not um, totally visualized there. Whereas on the right, you have all the same information as in that bar plot, but you also um, have more information. You can see here that uh, one of these treatments um, or uh, um, one of these parts of the data has an outlier. And this is hidden by this bar chart, but here you actually get more information. And that's an interesting part of the study. Uh, uh, the core of a lot of um, you know, the push for transparent reporting and sharing of research is rooted in the fact that um, when we share our research more fully and more completely, we often show a very interesting picture and it's not always as tidy as it is in the left with the bar chart. But instead, it can actually show us things that can lead to further questions, further exploration, other researchers chiming in and finding out what's going on with these outliers um, and that sort of thing. So that's part of why we should think about being as transparent as possible when we share our data. Um, so uh, in general, the rule is to avoid bar charts when you are dealing with continuous data. Um, so if you're using count data, if you're just say counting foxes or something like that, then a bar chart is appropriate. Um, if you're doing proportions out of say 100 or something like that, that is also appropriate for a bar chart. But if you're using, if you're trying to visualize um, continuous data, then you can see here that um, a bar chart can, can be the same for a variety of different uh, distributions of data. So it's not really giving you enough information um, about the actual um, uh, relationships between these different uh, little bits of uh, data and observation. So you can see here, we have distributions that are symmetric, distributions that have an outlier, distributions that are bimodal, so you have some clumping here and here, and distributions with an unequal number of observations in each uh, treatment of the study. So um, when you use a bar chart, you're just sort of glossing over all of that, and you're, it's a barrier to transparency. And in the long run, um, transparency is really at the core of what reproducibility uh, needs. So that's great. You know now you're not going to use a bar chart for continuous data. What should you do? Um, so this is just a nice sort of intro summary into some of the options available uh, for visualizing your data. So you want to think about the outcome variable of your data. So what are you measuring? Um, you want to think about how many observations you have, so the sample size. And you want to think about the uh, distribution of the data. So we talked a little bit about that before when you have bimodal data, so it's clumpy in one part um, um, and then clumpy in another. Um, and uh, there are lots of options depending on uh, these variables. So a dot plot is a good place to start, especially if you only have a small number of observations. People can easily take a look at that and get a nice sort of taste of what um, the data is all about. Um, there's also a box plot, which is a nice way of showing those summary statistics, the median and that sort of thing, um, while also still showing the points of your observations. So that's if you have 
um, you know, a, a not a small sample size, but enough that you can actually include the points. Um, a box plot for larger data is a great way of visualizing it because you do see that distribution. So if you have those outliers, they'll be captured by that visualization. Um, and then another um, option that you see more and more these days is a violin plot. So you can include uh, points in a violin plot or as they did here, just include sort of a th the, the actual thickness of the violin plot will vary depending on um, how many of your observations are within that um, level of your plot. Um, so the bar graph should be reserved for counts, as we said before. So if you're going one, two, three, four, you have four things, they can go on a bar graph um, or proportions. So um, when you decide to make a dot plot, which is like a, a majority of the things that you see in many uh, disciplines, um, the important thing is to make sure that all of your observations or your points are visible. Um, if you can't have them all be visible because you have too many of them, then you would choose a different type of plot. But uh, the other ways of making them more visible are by following these sort of uh, little guides. So when you have all of your points overlapping like this, you can't distinguish between them and it's not actually very helpful for understanding um, these data. Um, so your first step would be to make the points a little bit smaller. By making them um, semi-transparent, you also are able to illustrate where there are more observations because it will be darker. Um, you can also do that by what's called jittering, which is spreading them out a little bit. Um, and you can do that either randomly. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some software that allows you to do that in a minute, um, or symmetrically so that they sort of balance out like that. So that's mostly an aesthetic choice. Um, but you can see here that it's much easier when you compare uh, these plots to show these data versus these plots to show these data. This shows you a lot more. You have a better sense of the distribution of the data. <clears throat> and the second thing to think about is those summary st statistics we talked about before. So if you, um, if you are trying to create a, a plot that allows people at a glance to get a sense not only about uh, how your data is distributed, but also where the summary statistics are, then um, this plot on the far right um, has both the, the space for you to be able to, to distinguish between these different treatments, but also the summary statistics are nice and dark and very visible, and people have a good sense of where the median is um, when looking at this plot at a glance. So um, there are lots of ways to get started with making better visualizations of your data. Since we're an introductory workshop, um, we like to share tools that are um, easy to get started with, which is part of why we share this one, which is um, a, a way of creating interactive dot plots and interactive line graphs very simply. Um, you can take a look here at what it looks like. You can upload your data in a CSV file and um, work within the platform and then download it. So this is a, a, a little project called Statistica um, and um, it's free to use. Um, but uh, we also wanna introduce you to maybe the first steps in learning to do these in more advanced ways over time. So the best options in the long run, if you're planning on doing research um, and are interested in, in this being a career, or if you're just interested in learning how to code in general, um, I would recommend learning how to visualize your data using code. And the other benefit to this is that if you're using R or you're using um, Python or other open source languages, um, everything that you do will be free for you to do. Um, so uh, some of the uh, first steps, if you want to start visualizing your data using code, are um, to use R with ggplot2. That's a really commonly um, used uh, package for uh, doing scientific visualizations. If you're using Python, you can use pandas and plotly. 
Um, don't worry too much if you're not a coder right now. This is just to plant the seed that these things are out there. There's a, a big community of folks who will um, help you to, to answer your questions because these are open source tools. You do have these communities of practice that can help you uh, when you hit an error and you hit a, a problem. Um, and a great place to start is a group called the Carpentries. Uh, right now, I believe most of their workshops, Patul probably knows better, most of their workshops I think are being done virtually. Some of them are being done in person. Um, so uh, they run um, usually multiple day workshops uh, for uh, researchers to learn some of the basics of scientific programming. So you don't have to have any prior knowledge to come to these and get started. Um, and then there's also some options that don't require coding. So these ones don't require coding, but what they often do require is a licensing fee. So it will depend a little bit on your institution, whether or not you have um, the uh, license available, but Tableau and Prism are two options for you if you wanna try visualizations uh, that way. Great, so Batool, take it away. Thank you, April. Hi, everyone. I'm Batul Marzouk. I'm uh, most of you guys like in the previous sessions. I am a computation biologist. Um, yeah, uh, if you got any questions, I speak a bit fast, just let me know. Uh, next slide, April. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to speak with you guys about data and code sharing. Next slide. So what to share? Uh, People ask what exactly I need to share. You need to share the code and the data that you use to, to, to validate your finding, to support it, to make sure that others can really reproduce this result, can build in the top of your research. Um, this is not just valuable for researchers, it's also valuable for policymakers. Um, and sometimes it's not only data and code that you want to share, Sometimes also you want to share the environment that you've used to create the data. So uh, this is usually true in data science project. Having only the data and the code might not be really sufficient to reproduce the same results. So you need to know what operation system they've used, what versions of the software they've used. That's what we call the environment. Um, and sometimes, actually, when you go and you want to publish your results, your funders, your publisher can ask you, they can make that compulsory. They're not going to publish the result now in, your, in this journal unless you have this code and you have this data. But this is not only the only benefit they can get actually from publishing your data and code, but also you can get more citation. So suppose you did collect this data, but then you didn't get any interesting results from this data. If you have your data published, you, others can take this data, maybe extract really interesting results, and then they can cite you. And that way you can have your name and you can have citation of your data, even though you did not publish like um, a fancy paper or fancy results about it. Uh, and you're also going to preserve long-term access to the data. So, uh, so you know, this data is not going to get lost. I think we all experience like a problem with getting access to in-house data stored in some external hard drive that is no longer in the lab. Uh, some people do ask how to share the data. Uh, you want to share. You want to share what we call uh, open file format, which means that anyone without the software can open them. So for example, if you have a data um, in CSV file, this can be opened in any operation system. But if you have something uh, using um, Microsoft uh, Word or Microsoft Excel, these really, you need to buy the software to open them. So you wanna use open file format. And also you wanna create really a documentation about the code. As I said, having the code is not really sufficient to reproduce the result. You need to, to describe how to use this code, how to use the environment. You wanna have this readme file that describe and document how to reuse this data and this code. You also, you wanna include that citation. So if you use 
data from others, you want to analyze them, you want to make sure you cite them inside your source, and you want to create a rich metadata. If, if, if anything is important, I would say, and if you can't even like um, have uh, a DOI as I'm going to describe later on, you want to have what we call the rich metadata. Rich metadata mean uh, how do you collect the data? This is extremely important when others are going to try to troubleshoot or analyze the, the, like, uh, the result that they find using your data. Because if they don't know how these data are collected, how these columns are yeah, collected, what does it mean exactly? They're not going to be able to troubleshoot. Or sometimes not just a troubleshooting, sometimes they're going to get really uh, like they they gonna interrupt it in a different way. They are gonna get totally different result than what was supposed to be because there is no rich metadata included with this data that you published. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, just a graph showing that why do we want to preserve access to the data? If you shared if you shared your data through a link. I think we all experienced this. You got this link for some paper and then you come back six months later and you can't access it, it's a broken link. And this is really problematic if, if it happened to scientific data. We need something like a unique ID that lasts forever or lasts like for a very, very long time. Uh, and this is how you can access this data, not without not with a URL, but with what we call a unique ID. And this is where repository come to place. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So what this repository is gonna provide you, it's gonna provide what we call the resistant identifier or unique ID or DOI. DOI stands for digital object identifier that is gonna last or preserved or backed up. Um, this is not the only benefit. You actually can also control who's going to access this data. So if your data, you don't want it to be public, you want to just have a particular people to access this data, you can control the access. You can have some kind of burgeoning. Uh, by burgeoning, I mean, uh, if you add or change anything in the data or the metadata, you can have burgeoning for that. And you can have what we call license. And license means how your data is or your code is going to be used. And I think license could be sometimes overwhelming. There's all types of licenses. Uh, there's license for data, there's license for code. For data, we call we use what we call the Creative Commons license. Uh, this is, could be CC0, CC BY. You're going to see the CC BY in a lot of places. CC0, you mean you can use this data without attribution, but CC BY mean, means that you need to attribute whoever you use the data from. And you can find really a guide for in this digital curation set term, this link. There is also what we call code license. And if you've been involved with any kind of open source project, you're going to see this MIT or BSD license. MIT particularly means if anyone uses the source code, they need also to make their source code open. So they can't make a private. Uh, you can find all about these, um, the meaning of all these licenses in this Carl Proman link of the open source initiative. They have really description for each uh, and for every license. Next slide, please. So going back to repository that I'm gonna produce this ID, what kind of repository I'm gonna use? There's all kind of repositories, so which one I've got to choose? Sometimes your funder, who's, who's funded your project or your PhD or your, um, yeah, your research, they can ask you to add your data or code in particular repositories, specific repositories. So in this uh, case, you don't have any option. Sometimes you want to use what we call the institutional data repository. And this most likely accept any data. Uh, and it does ensure like you have that policy requirement for long-term access also met. Sometimes you want to use what we call domain or discipline specific data repository. Um, these offer specialist domain knowledge and data management expertise needed that you can ensure your data collection is probably kept and used. But if none of these is the one that you want to use, you want to go for general purpose repository. Next slide, please. Uh, 
so what I use usually is this general purpose repository. You have all the time, you've got this picture, the node. Uh, I mostly use the node. Uh, these are all free digital repository, but sometimes you have this uh, limit of the data that you can upload. With picture, you've got five gigabytes. With the node, you've got, it's more generous, you've got 50 gigabytes per data set. And what I love about Zenodio, particularly, you can link it to GitHub. It's integrate with other application. And next slide, please. So this is an example. This is, um, uh, yeah, I've taken it from my uh, repository and from my Zenodio. This is basically a, just a two minutes presentation. It's nothing really significant. It's nothing really special. Just a two minutes presentation. I made it with uh, our Markdown. But what I did, it was in my repository, it was in my GitHub, to, to make a persistent identifier or DOI, I linked it to Zenodio. And you can link it by creating a release in GitHub. Uh, and it's really, it's very easy. It's like three steps outlined here. Uh, you create that release and you get the badge. It's very, very quick. And then you get what we call uh, the DOI. Uh, it says here, when you go to Zenodo, it says that it's an, available in GitHub. It does link it, does link the code to it. And you got all this metadata here. You got all the views and how many one is downloaded your data. Uh, and you can get like not just one version, you can get one version, two or three. In this case, I've got four versions of this two minutes of presentation. Yeah. Um, so in summary, uh, next slide, please. In summary, what you want to do is having your data being findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And you're going to hear a lot about this FAIR principle. And what we mean, this is basically just a summary of what I've said previously, what we mean by findable, that the first step in reusing any data is to find them. So descriptive metadata, information about the data, such as keywords, is really important. And you want it to be accessible. So once the user finds the data and the software, they need to know how to access it. That it could be openly available, but it's also possible that authentication and authorization procedure are necessary. So even if you, if you don't want it to be open, at least there is a procedure. There's a procedure for authorization for access in a place that you can, it's not really stored in the hard drive then somewhere um, that you can't, you don't know who to contact, who to email. You, you want to have these procedures. And you want the data also to be interoperable. So data needs to be integrated with other data and interpret with application or workflow, like the case with the Zenodo and GitHub. Uh, and then you want it to be reusable. So data should be well described so they can be used, combined, and extended in different settings. And that's simply what we call the FAIR principles. And this is uh, also illustration by the Turing Way. The Turing Way is an amazing guide. And it's really just, uh, it does outline the FAIR principle and everything about open science in a very simple way. So for people who've never heard about open science or FAIR principle or reproducible, they can understand it. So if you did not come across the Turing Way, uh, I'm gonna post it in the chat later on. So have a look at it. Uh, that's pretty much it. I'm going to give it back to April. Awesome. Thank you so much, Batul. Um, yeah, so I would just want to plus one the Turing way as a great place to start. And the other thing I'm going to do is add that to the handout so people can find that there. Um, we are at time right now, but I will hang around for another couple minutes to answer questions. Um, Batul, if you have to run, no worries. Go ahead and run. Um, but uh, I just hope that this has been a good starting point for you guys to get started with analyzing and sharing data and code. Um, there's lots more to learn and we have uh, other videos and resources available if you want to uh, dive a little deeper. But remember to just, you just need to think of one thing to do to get started with reproducibility. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. Think about the thing that you think will benefit yourself the most and get started. Um, so uh, thanks again to uh, the ECR Tanzania group for um, helping us organize this and to our sponsors, Chan Zuckerberg and Adgene. 
Um, everything's reusable. So if you want to run this project yourself, run this workshop, go ahead. Uh, we love it when people do that. And we do have a feedback survey. If there's things you'd like to see us add, if there's things you thought weren't clear, let us know. Um, so I'm gonna dive into the etherpad now and see what sort of questions we have. And if you have a question, also feel free to um, unmute and or raise your hand. Yeah, I don't see any questions right now. Cool. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Sometimes with the with the uh, shorter meetings, we don't have questions in the etherpad. That's fine too. Anyone have questions they want to put in the chat? We have a few thank yous. Great. Thanks for coming, everyone. And um, again. Uh, come to our workshop or come to our website or reach out to us if you want to get involved. There's no experience necessary. Um, and if your institution you think could um, would have an interest in a little workshop like this, just let us know. This is what we do. <laughs> All right, everybody have an um, excellent. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I just I just wanted to say thank you. It's been three workshops already, and when we were planning, um, it was in January. Uh, we thought May was so far, but uh, thank you for the commitment. The workshops have been great. I especially enjoyed today's workshop, and I think I I found where to start with that visualization, the learning. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Annette. And thank you so much for helping to, uh, you know, organize this and plant the this idea. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so keep in touch, everyone. Anyone else have a, a question or comment before we go? Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.